Love is such a priceless treasure that you can redeem the whole world by it and expiate not only your sins, but the sins of others. This is from the Brothers Karamazov. And this is our introduction to Europe uh, after the fall of Napoleon, just to give us a little bit of a background to this wonderful novel. Now, you might notice um, I just read to you an, uh, a quote about love. This is a novel about love, but it's definitely set in a world of political tensions. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to just go into a little bit of detail about the world that Dostoevsky was describing. So in Europe in 1815, we have uh, the fall of Napoleon, right? And we have all of Europe trying to recover from the Napoleonic Wars. And we have the Congress of Vienna, Prince Metternich. And so there's definitely a movement of conservatives, political conservatives who say, wow, that was enough. Let's recover and let's return the world to the way that it used to be. And of course, what was the world before Napoleon and the French Revolution? Well, we had a world of kings and privilege and we had a world where religion had a privileged place. Well, as I'm sure you know, there's no going back. The Congress of Vienna was a failure. Europe had already woken to the ideas coming out of the French Revolution and Napoleon. So we have what we call the rise of liberalism. And when we say liberalism for, for these times, we mean the rights of the individual. People are interested in getting rid of privilege. Um, they want more say in the running of their government. And so we have the rise of secularism, the rise of the secular state, and the role of religion is diminished. So while this is happening and people are um, becoming more interested in these issues, we have revolutions. So in Europe, we have revolutions in 1830. They sweep across Europe. And then again in 1848. And so these are violent uh, revolutions. Now, Russia, we're going to talk about Russia a little bit later on. She's going to respond to this, but in a different way. And it's interesting when we look at Russia, you'll see she takes ideas from the West and kind of brings them to the extreme. Now, there's a lot of isms also going on during this time. Uh, we have the rise of nationalism. We have the rise of materialism in science, the idea that uh, there's no mystery in the universe. There's no life after death. We also have the rise of socialism and Marxism. And I really want to draw our attention to these two isms. They're very important in all of Dostoevsky's work. First of all, I think it's important to remember socialism and communism, or more uh, in particular, Marxism, are not the same. So socialism is a movement, particularly in France, where there are ideas about sharing wealth. Some of them are Christian. Um, so they, there's, there's different versions of that. And not all of them are necessarily hostile to religion. Once we head into the writings of Karl Marx, this is a totally different world. This is the rise of communism, Marxism. And really, to be technical, it's the rise of what we call dialectical materialism. And this is where Marx takes the writings of Hegel, kind of, they say, turns it on its head. And he is going to look at all of history, Marx is, he's going to look at it as a movement where um, economic classes take dominance over other economic classes. This is a sweeping view of history. He claims that it's scientific. And these ideas are going to sweep through Europe. And of course, eventually find their way into Russia. So I think it's important to keep these isms in mind. We also have the rise of utilitarianism. Uh, this is the idea where we're just looking for the most uh, benefit, for the most amount, for the, for the most, for the highest number of people. And um, this is going to lead to a diminishment of the, the individual and the caring of the human person. We also have the rise of rationalism. When I say rationalism, I mean a refusal to admit that there are any limitations to reason or to science. While all this is going on in the 19th century in Europe, this, this complete denial of mystery, and it's going to lead to a lot of anti 
Catholicism, anti-clericalism. While all that's going on in Europe and you move over to Russia, you're going to see that while she has some of these same movements, she has a small um, or let's say a very powerful segment of society that believes still in religion. And in particular, it's interesting when you look at Russia, she believes in the value of suffering and redemption. And so I think it'd be interesting right now to look at Russia in a little more detail. Well, I'm here with Mr. Blaine, who's going to um, help us go a little bit deeper into some of the issues uh, about Russia in the 19th century. But first, I just thought it'd be fun, Mr. Blaine, tell me why you like the Brothers Karamazov. I love this novel because, to me, it shows how all of mankind is united spiritually. So we're uh, not saved by ourselves and we're not damned by ourselves, but we have to rely on other people. And I think that's really important for us to understand. Um, And it's difficult for us to accept sometimes because of our pride, but I think it's an important part of growing as human beings and spiritually that we have to rely on other people to become holier. And we really see that in the Russian people as displayed in the novel and in um, a lot of the important ideas that the characters bring up. Um, I I, I think that's interesting. I like how you say that. I think um, when we look at Russia, like you were saying, Dostoevsky, he is so concerned about the people. You know, and I think it's interesting just to go back a little bit in history to set the novel up. You know, I was just reading uh, the novel was written in 1879 in Russia. It covers the 1860s, but they say it feels like the 1870s. So um, I think what's interesting about Russia is how she a lot of times takes ideas from the West and kind of brings them to the extreme. Um, And this goes all the way back to Peter the Great. who I think died in 1725. But tell, tell us, Mr. Blaine, what is it about the West, the Western ideas in Russia that causes such a problem? I think one of the big things that the Russians wanted to imitate, especially under Peter the Great, was they saw the West as being orderly, as being technological. Yes. So um, I remember in my studies of Peter the Great that he, when he, was living in Russia, he liked to spend time with the Germans, Mm -hmm. liked to spend time with the Westerners. And he actually spent time in, and he actually brought foreign workers into Russia to sort of industrialize Russia and bring Russia up to speed. He saw Russia as backward and as um, disorderly, as sort of, um, you you probably already, already know this, as one of the things that he asked the Russian men to do was to cut their beards. And he saw this as a westernizing influence. He wanted Russia to be able to compete in this new enlightenment philosophy. And you've pointed out before to me that the Russians really loved all things French. So they saw the French, Mm -hmm. you know, the French revolution, um, you know, maybe Western European or German or English industry. They saw that as things as worthy of being imitated. And Dostoevsky, really, he drew on the spiritual roots of Russia. Right. And I think um, looking at the spiritual roots is very important for Dostoevsky. Um, In the 19th century, we have the rise of what's called um, Slavophilism. So these are Russians who are concerned that their spiritual origins are getting lost in this westernizing process that you're talking about. Um, They feel they're going to become spiritually bankrupt. And so You have this whole uh, group of people who want to keep Russia Russian, I guess. And so you have all this tension going on. So we have the Decemberist revolt in 1825. And you see um, you have a political movement of Russians trying to uh, be modernized. And the state does not respond well. And so this is going to lead to the rise of radicalism. And And we'll see when we look at Dostoevsky's life that he got involved in these kind of movements. But I think it's really important to look at some of the specific groups of radicals because they're going to you know, be discussed in our novel. Um, what about the rise of the Narodniki? 
the Narodniki, they, these were a politically conscious group of uh, intellectuals. We call them the Russian intelligentsia. And they felt renewal could be found by going to the people. But of course, these are intellectuals. So when they go and try to live with the people and live like peasants on the land, it doesn't go so well. And they also have some Western ideas that wasn't um, what really in touch with, with just your regular people. Now, while all this is going on, um, we have the liberation of the serfs in 1861. What did this mean to the uh, to the Russian people? I think the Russians saw the liberation of the serfs as becoming more democratic, yeah. more egalitarian, and they thought that um, you know the czar. Of course, this is going to culminate in the Russian Revolution yes. in the early 1900s. But they saw the czar as sort of medieval, I think. Yes. They saw the stratified society as medieval. And of course, we see that in a lot of um, perhaps the revolutionary movements of today is they want everyone to be equal. But I think somewhere in the Brothers Karamasov, he says that the equality of man is a spiritual equality. Yeah. It's not an equality based on where right. they are in the society. And going back to what you were saying earlier, the effects of the French Revolution, you have all these thinkers who think you can build a modern utopia. Mm -hmm. And Dostoevsky, while he started that way, he just was so against that. He just thought, like you're saying, it, that's never going to happen in concrete, let's say, economic terms. He wanted to look at it more in a spiritual way. And so in Russia, you have this, the freedom of the serfs. Everyone gets their hopes up. And then Alexander II, the czar, is assassinated in 1881. What does that do to the intelligentsia and their hopes for a different Russia? I think one of the things it shows that um, maybe the Slavophilism is not going to win out and mm -hmm. maybe the communism or the Marxist ideas are going to win out. And I think you see this in the novel, um, certainly, but it's sort of, um, what's the word? An omen for the hard future that yes. awaits Russia. I, th I think that's a great word you're using. I do think the novel is an omen. Mm -hmm. And I do think Dostoevsky was a prophet and he was convinced that catastrophic events were going to come. And I, he has the characters um, warning us about that. So, yes, I, I would definitely agree. Um, I was just uh, speaking to someone who had been to Russia recently, and she made the point when the communists came into power after the Russian Revolution, they pretty much put Dostoevsky on the shelf. Um, that's not something the Soviet Union was interested in highlighting because it's not a sunny picture, right? It was too real for them. And really, uh, scholars just had to look into that. So I think it's interesting when you, you mentioned communism, if, if we jump to later in history, um, Dostoevsky goes into eclipse, let's say, during the Soviet period. Um, but now, um, since, the, since the fall of communism, uh, we really see a rebirth. That's certainly true. I'm, I'm reading a book or was reading a book called Everyday Saints. And it was about um, a Russian man who became um, a Russian monk. But while he was in college, just before the fall of the Soviet Union, maybe 10 years before, he um, was reading Dostoevsky. So it was almost like there was a recovery of their literature yes. before there was a spiritual or a political recovery wow. And I think that's really important because we talk about that here at our school, mm -hmm. right? That these things sort of go hand in hand. And um, he loved Dostoevsky. And this was before Pestroika yes. and before the fall mm -hmm. of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. But before that happened, even before he was, he was, actually wasn't even baptized, but he was reading Dostoevsky and he loved the brothers Karamazov. So I think that's a really good point. Um, I think it does go hand in hand. Um, and I think it's a, I don't know, it's a really powerful way for us, I think, in our times, <clears throat> all the questions that we're having in our country about building social utopias, how to deal with the breakdown of our economic system, our schools, or our families. I think um, looking at these issues are going to give us some answers. It's going to be a window into some of these issues. So, yeah, I think um, it's really helpful to look at some of these events in Russian history. So do you have anything you'd like to add? 
Um, well, just as a comment on that recently um, in Sochi, um, a Russian leader was talking about how he said in Russia, we value our history. We value yes. our, where we come from. And he sort of looks at the West now with incomprehension. And he says, why don't they value their traditions, their history? Why don't they value that? And why are they losing that? Yes. And to him, it seemed sort of, um, he talked about, the taking out of literature to make everything sort of uniform. Yes. And he said, here in Russia, we honor and love the, our history. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a kind of interesting. I think Dostoevsky would be pleased with those words. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Blaine, tell me a little bit about the role of the monasteries in the 19th century in Russia. So during the 1800s, um, along with the literary revival and sort of this rediscovery of who the Russians were, there was also the spiritual revival, the growth of many monasteries, many monks. And we saw that really attacked in um, the early 1900s during the revolution. So one of the things that really illustrated to me the severity of the tax, but also the health of the Russian church right before the revolution was that they, we know that at least 28 bishops were killed in Russia at the beginning of the 1900s. So in the 1800s, you saw maybe as many, I think it was 40,000 monks okay. or 40,000 monks and priests. So the Russian church, the Russian Orthodox church, at least was very strong. Um, and that came along together with these, these movements in the Russian literature. And you were talking about the Narodniks, right? Yes. Yes. You could kind of think of them as uh, pre hippies, let's say, um, but there were definitely movements to try to to revitalize Russian life, and I think probably what you're talking about, the revival in the monasteries, is something that's going to be obviously more fruitful. Um, and I think it's interesting when we talk about the Russian Revolution. Um, that's a focal point, of course, for the apparitions at Fatima. Right, Our Lady asked specifically for Russia for prayers for Russia and to be consecrated to her immaculate heart. So I think we can never talk enough about um, the role of the Russian revolution and what it's meant for our modern times. And I think the brothers Karamazov is a great way to delve into the deeper issues. When we're talking about the brothers Karamazov, a happy memory for me, I was Mr. Blaine's high school teacher. And I remember he would come and share with me how his grandfather was reading Dostoevsky to him. So tell us about that. Well, I think that's really, that was a beautiful experience for me, but I think it's also, I, re I see this again in, in the novel actually, because Alyosha meets the schoolboys, right? Yes. And so it's this idea that the school is sort of a microcosm of the world. Yes. So you see this fighting in the school, the schoolboys are throwing rocks at each yes. other. And um, yet in the school, they're also passing on. Um, clearly, there's a lot of quotation of scripture in this book. They're passing on the scripture and they're also passing on classical civilization. Yes. Right. And this is um, in the one of the questions the boys ask is what is who founded Troy? And actually, as a, uh, the school teacher doesn't know. <laughs> And he just says sort of a general group of people. And they mentioned that in the novel. But the, the really cool thing about this is that um, the, the sort of the struggles between the boys and one of the boys dying is sort of a reflection of the struggles in the adults, yes. right? But at the same time, there's sort of this lightheartedness and this joy that the boys bring to the education, the students, not obviously not just boys, but boys and girls and all of the students we see. And we also see that in our classes, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's interesting that it's present here in the novel and it actually ends the novel, not to give the ending away. That's true. You're so right. I, I like your idea of the classroom as a microcosm so, of the world. I think Dostoevsky would be pleased with that. And it's interesting when you, when I was your teacher and you would come and talk about the novel and I delved into it more seriously, I think the novel means a lot to me personally, um, Although my family's Italian, um, my grandfather suffered a lot in World War II. He was a partisan and was captured by the Nazis, and he perished in a concentration camp. And I myself, when I went on to school to try to figure out, I guess, what happened, because um, it was so traumatic for my family, I really found a lot of um, 
meet, let's say, in Russian literature, right? So even though my own background's in French literature, I think it's the Russians who have answers for a lot of the modern um, traumatic events of the 20th century. Even though he's writing in the 19th century, he's letting us know what's to come. But we're still dealing with the repercussions today. And that's what I think is exciting about the novel is um, I think there are so many moments of healing Mm -hmm. and a way to deal with some of these difficult issues. I can see it in my own family. Um, There's a lot of hope. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. And you see that in the multiple generations, right? So you have this um, Theodore, right? The kind of the head of the family. Then you see the brothers and you see sort of the light sides, the dark sides of this. Um, But yeah, this possibility that through memory, through remembering both the good, the healing of the bad memories and through the the sort of the beauty of the good memories that there is healing possible. And then they pass it on to the next generation. So you see the young people, um, they say Karamasov, you know, so it becomes for them something good. Whereas, so it's a a very redemptive, right? Absolutely. And I think that's why this gigantic book is worth reading and taking a whole year to do. Yeah. 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 Thank you. That, that gives me a lot to think about. Yeah. So both the family, but then also, I, I don't know, we talk, we talk about these images. Each of us has sort of maybe th- aspects of the three brothers or aspects of the novel inside of our, our own life. Ab- right. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And so. I like how, like we say, even though um, Dostoevsky doesn't hide anything, it's, it can be a rough novel. Sometimes there is that hope. Yes. Yeah. So now that we've looked at the 19th century in Europe and some ideas that were happening in Russia in the 19th century, I think it's important that we look at Dostoevsky himself as a person and how he, uh, let's say, balances these two worlds. Dostoevsky was born in 1821. Um, He had a very loving mother. Um, he it, not such a great relationship with his father. His mother died uh, when he was young. Um, his father is interesting. Some people believe that Dostoevsky's father was actually murdered by the serfs in his own household. So we, we probably don't know the full story about that. So he has an interesting uh, relationship with his parents. Um, As Dostoevsky grew into a young man, he actually became involved in some of the revolutionary circles that we talked about earlier. Um, And he actually got himself thrown into prison and he was sentenced to death. And there is such an important experience for him. He was going to be killed. And at the last moment, the czar changed his mind. So I'm sure we can imagine what it would have been like for him to have his whole life uh, pass before his eyes. Now, he was sent to Siberia for four years for imprisonment and for exile, and he completely changed during that time in prison. He came to see that a lot of the ideas that the intellectuals had about the Russian people, the Russian peasant were not grounded in reality. And let's not forget, when he's in uh, Siberia, he's living with hardened criminals. So he has this close view of criminal life. And he also uh, is clutching a New Testament. A, A woman hands him a New Testament. And he says, for the most part, that's all he read for four years. So he has a big religious conversion. It changed his life, and it's what led him to Christ. During that time, he came to really... Um, detest the ideas, the idea of the Western intellectual that you could build a political utopia. Um, of course, he would also be imprisoned with a lot of socialists, um, communists, and, and capitalists. Dostoevsky also had a lot of problems with unbridled capitalism. So a lot of these isms, he's going to reject and develop his own philosophy philosophy about the meaning of life and suffering and redemption um, in prison. Now, as Dostoevsky becomes a writer, um, it's important to remember that while he is very distinctive, he's a, he's a genius, he's an original genius, he, he isn't writing in a vacuum. He is 
um, affected by many authors. There's too many to talk about, but I do want to mention a few, and these won't be surprising to you. So for any Russian, um, he's one is going to be affected by Pushkin, uh, Gogol, Alexander Herzen, who's considered um, the father of Russian socialism, Belinsky, who was a famous critic influenced by Western ideas. Anyone who wanted to be anyone in Russia and, and do writing um, would have to have some sort of relationship with Belinsky, which they started out well. Uh, they worked together, um, but then they did have a falling out and Belinsky became more radical and, and became a socialist. He was also influenced by uh, Western writers. If you look at Brothers Karamazov carefully, you'll see hints of Balzac, Vic Victor Hugo, Georges Sand. But in particular, I want to talk about the German writer Schiller, Friedrich Schiller. Uh, he died in 1805, and there is so much of Schiller in the Brothers Karamazov. In fact, some people think the Brothers K is a rewriting of the robbers. This was an emotional, um, uh, violent play that Schiller wrote. And so some people think um, that this is a, a reproduction of that. Schiller came up with the concept of die schöne Seele. So forgive my German, but that's the beautiful soul. And this is his idea of, I guess, coming to terms with Kant and Kant's philosophy about duty and imperative. And Schiller is painting a portrait of a character who does the good spontaneously. It just comes naturally. It's not just duty. Well, Dostoevsky loved this idea. He's going to take it and he's going to reshape it. It's a German idea. It's going to make it Russian. He's going to put it into the Brothers Karamazov. And he's going to show how some characters will voluntarily take up suffering to atone for sin. And it may not even be their sin. It's just for sin. And it's a central concept concept in the Brothers Karamazov. And I think it's important to recognize that it comes from Schiller. We will also see characters in the novel quote and misquote Schiller. And so that's why some scholars believe that uh, the Brothers Karamazov in one way is a rewriting of Schiller's play, The Robbers, which is um, a violent, emotional play. But uh, Dostoevsky will rework it for his own purposes. Um, we also see the Book of Job is very important background for the Brothers Karamazov. And I want to also, when we're talking about authors that influence Dostoevsky, those are very literary ones. There were also some political authors that were very important. So in Russia, as uh, we mentioned with Mr. Blaine, there's, there's a dialogue between intellectuals about what to do with all of the socio-political problems in Russia. And it's interesting, a lot of the intellectuals write books with questions. So um, I mentioned Alexander Herzen. In 1845, he wrote a book called Who is to Blame? And so he is examining, using Western ideas, um, some of them, how are we going to help Russia modernize? How are we going to deal with some of the problems that we have? Well, then later, we have a famous, famous book uh, called Fathers and Sons by Tergenev. This is in 1862. You can tell from the title, there are problems in the family, father, son, generations, the breakdown of the family. In this novel, though, there is a character named Bazarov. And he is a nihilist and a radical. Um, he, he's disillusioned. Um, he's, his character is uh, central to revolutionary thought. And this novel took the whole uh, country by storm. People kept uh, debating about Bazarov and uh, w what to do about this character. Well, in response, another intellectual, Nikolai Chernichevsky, wrote a book called What is to be Done. This is in 1863. So you can see how these intellectuals are all speaking to each other. Um, and in this novel, in his response, we have a woman, Vera Pavlovna, who escapes control of her family um, and an arranged marriage. She's looking for economic independence. Um, this novel is also has radical characters. And so these authors are presenting radical ideas to the problems in Russia. Well, Dostoevsky 
he's going to present his own answer in his novels, not just in the Brothers Karamazov, also in Crime and Punishment and some of his other novels. But you want to keep all these writers in the background and all the debates going on. These are the authors that um, the readers of Dostoevsky would have been familiar with, and they would know that he is definitely responding to them. I thought it would be interesting to share Dostoevsky's own words about the brothers Karamazov. He wrote, the portrayal of the uttermost blasphemy and the seed of the idea of destruction in our time in Russia, among the young people uprooted from reality and along with the blasphemy and anarchy, well, he says the refutation of them, which is now being prepared by me in the last words of the dying elder Zosima. So Dostoevsky is saying in his novel, he wants to show what all the young people are reading and he wants to refute them. I think it's important because sometimes people misread Dostoevsky and thinks um, maybe he's supporting some of them because of the lines of the characters. But he is saying, no, I want to show how these are dead end answers. And he's going to have the actual answer in the words of the elder. And I think Mr. Blaine did a great job earlier of um, talking about what the answer is. Um, But we're going to see that worked out through the characters. Um, Dostoevsky said, all of socialism has sprung from and began with the denial of the meaning of historical reality. And um, I think that's really important because when we look at Marxism and these intellectuals, we see they're not in touch with reality. They don't work the land or work in the factories. They have ideas stemming from the Enlightenment. So another thing to keep in mind when you read Dostoevsky, because he has an extreme view of the West and he wants to keep Russia Russian, he equates Catholicism with socialism. In his mind, Catholicism Uh, Westernism, socialism, he lumps them all together. Because um, we know in history, Eastern religion is very much concerned with the restoration, the keeping of tradition. The gift of the Catholic Church is taking modern ideas and baptizing them. That's what Catholics are famous for, right? When Aquinas picked up Aristotle, that's what he was doing. The Easterners are not so comfortable with that. So there's that tension. And so Dostoevsky has a negative view of Catholicism, which we'll see later, what we'll see with the Grand Inquisitor. So we want to keep that in mind, some of his prejudices. Although you'll see in book one, there is a Catholic uh, crucifix. And I think he probably included that to kind of balance out um, his ideas a a little bit. So these, um, these are just some of the ideas that went into Dostoevsky's writing of the novel. Um, we've looked at some literary ideas, some political ideas, some spiritual ideas, and we'll revisit them. But I think it's helpful to just kind of um, give us some more context. So thank you for your time.